Hello class and welcome. Today we're going to go over signal flow. So that's chapter five. So make sure again that you've already read that, read over that before we uh, continue on. Uh, before we get too far into signal flow, I want to talk about the different signal voltage levels. So these are power levels. So these are the signals that we're going to find our analog signals in. It's either going to be something low voltage or, or maybe even high voltage. So let's start at the beginning. Mic level. It's a low voltage signal. Usually needs to be increased to what we call line level with our preamp. Remember our preamp is just going to add voltage to our signal. So as our mic hits our preamp, we're going to increase our voltage up to what we call line level. Line level is where the signal no longer requires a preamp to increase its amplitude. It's already right at the proper stage in which we, we can actually store that information. So like in Pro Tools, Pro Tools is expecting we want to bring our mic levels up to line level and we'll store them in Pro Tools as line level. That way everything that outputs Pro, to Pro Tools will actually already be at line level. Uh, next is what we call speaker level. This is high voltage signal and it's being sent from an amplifier to powered speakers. So a lot of times our mixer uh, will output to an amplifier uh, that then powers some speakers. So from the amplifier to the speaker is what we call high voltage. So the, the signal, uh, the cable that's going to run it is usually just a two conductors, no shield. It's just sending that signal to the speaker and allowing uh, that high voltage to make its way back to the ground. Um, so you want to be careful with high voltage cables because technically because it is high voltage, if you were to touch the signal to the ground while the amplifier is getting signal, you can't actually shock yourself. So you want to be careful with high voltage. Let's talk about the recording stages. So first we've got capture, that's stage one. This is where we're actually still going to usually be using mic level. Maybe some signals will be already be at line level. But in any case, this is where we're going to be plugging our signals into the console and then either increasing them to line level or, or allowing them to remain at line level. Uh, we're usually going to do that with either a microphone or a DI. Uh, into a preamp, uh, and then that will then go into our storage device, which is chap uh, which is uh, stage two. Uh, stage two is storage. That's where we're going to store the sound into the recording device. So that's where uh, you know just Pro Tools effectively or a tape machine. Uh, the third stage is monitoring. So this is where we're going to output from our recording device uh, back into some way that we can then hear it. So it's hearing the sound stored on the on either speakers. Uh, or headphones. So it's just the, the actual act of listening to it. So sometimes we might use, uh, you know, like for for my examples usually, I'm using channels for my microphones at least for my voice. I'm using microphone inputs 5 and 6 into Pro Tools. Pro Tools is stored at, uh, at line level because I'm using my preamps to increase my mic signal to, uh, to that line level. Uh, and then Pro Tools is going to output out of a separate output onto its own set of channels. Remember, for mine, channels three and four. And those are what are then ultimately being sent out of my mixer to either the amplifier built into my speakers uh, or the little headphone amp that I'm using to monitor. Cool. So the analog model of signal flow is as such. So we've already talked about capture, store, monitor. So when we're recording, we're going to use all three stages. Again, capturing, usually using a preamp to get into the storage device, exiting the storage device to something that is effectively going to then hit a amplifier, power some speakers. Uh, when we're mixing, however, uh, we aren't doing the capture or the storage stage. That's already been done for us. When we're mixing, we're just outputting from the storage device to something where we can then monitor it. So that's in mixing, we're just using that third stage, just monitoring. Live sound, because we're not actually going to be storing the information, we just need uh, stage one and stage two. So we're going to capture the information using a preamp to increase the line level. We usually then just send that out the mix out, uh, or maybe out some aux uh, sends uh, to headphone mixes, monitors, and to our speakers. Cool, so there's two types of uh, consoles that I kind of want to talk about now that we've talked about uh, these three stages. There's inline and there's split consoles. Split consoles, effectively when recording, half of the console's faders are going to be used for sending level to the recorder, and the app other half of the faders are used to monitor the sound returning from the recorder. So we're just going to use, just like here, I've got channels 5 and 6 inputting into uh, my recording device, and I've got output 3 and 4 so that we can monitor it. Uh, however, alternatively, we have inline consoles. 
Those allow a user to both send and receive signal on, the, on a single channel when recording. Sometimes adds an additional pot for separating mix A and mix B. Sometimes separates the preamp from the fader before the recording and returns the same uh, returns to the same fader post the recording. So for something like that, it'd be a console that effectively allows you to patch out of your preamp out into your recording device. Then we can output from our recording device, bypass the preamp, and go straight to the fader. They're pretty neat. Effectively for that, you can use a 16 channel inline console, the same as you could a 32 channel split console, which is pretty neat. The patch bay, we'll just talk about it again, but this is effectively how we're gonna allow that signal to flow uh, from you know input to out, or from output to input. Uh, the patch bay is gonna contain all of the inputs and outputs of most, if not all of the equipment in the recording studio. And it's gonna allow access and ability to redirect our signal flow as well. Let's check out this video here. Uh, Tim uh, did for us uh, as an example for signal flow within a studio. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about signal flow and signal flow is how when I plug in the mic, it goes through the whole system and comes out of the speakers. And so one of the things we wanna keep in mind when we're talking about signal flow are three words, mic, line, and speaker, right? So we've already created a track, so it's gonna start first with plugging in the mic. So we already plugged in the mic and that's where it starts off with mic, right? And so keeping in mind those three levels of power, mic, line, and speaker, to boost it to the next level of power, which is line, we have to use a preamp, and this is the preamp right here. It's a mic pre, and it boosts the gain of the microphone to that next level of power. In this case, we turn up the mic pre right here. The signal goes through the channel, and along with the fader and the preamp, is com or those are combined together, and that's the signal that we send into Pro Tools or whatever DAW that we're working with. So just kind of keep in mind the preamp could be off of your interface. It could be, you know, a standalone preamp, whatever it happens to be. And so that's the first thing we're going to do is turn up that mic, right? All right. So we plugged in the mic. We turned up the preamp, right? Boosted it to the next level of power line. We store the information at line level, whatever doll that we're working in, right? And so then the next thing we need to do is get it out of our DAW, our tape machine, right? And so in this case, we selected output one, which shows up in the monitor return section right here. So that way we can monitor the sound that, we, that we're recording, right? So in this case, it comes over to the monitor return section and we have to choose the stereo link up here because no matter how many tracks we record, right? It ends up on two tracks or two channels. And so by selecting the stereo link here, it, it puts it over to the stereo bus, which then feeds it to the speakers, right? So again, mic, line, and speaker. Cool, awesome. Well, hopefully, hopefully that uh, clarified a few things as far as visuals. Uh, if not, of course, you know y'all can still ask me questions in class. Cool. So let's move on to monitoring positions. Uh, so ultimately, uh, whenever you are uh, mixing. Um, and you've got your signal to the speakers and they're now outputting uh, to where you can hear them. Uh, we want to make sure they're in the right position uh, for the, the most uh, ideal stereo image. So typically you wanna, want them to be placed symmetrically within a room. You wanna make sure they're centered to the room so we aren't too close to a wall over here and a lot of space over here. We wanna make sure we're nice and symmetrical. Um, typically you wanna have about a 60 degree uh, 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 turn right here so that they actually kind of they angle 60 degrees in uh, to point at you and then you want to center yourself up once you've kind of angled in about 60 degrees kind of line them up to where they line up to your head to where you know you're, you're you've got your left on the left side you've got your right on the right side and that's what we call the sweet spot once you found your sweet spot of course your sweet spots not going to be perfect because there's no such thing as a perfect acoustic space. Um, we can get idyllic, um, but in all reality, everyone is listening 
in different places. So you always want to reference your mix on more than one speaker set. So of course we've already listened in our in our studio, but then once you you bounce that uh, that mix down, you want to go ahead and reference it uh, possibly in your car, uh, possibly on some headphones, especially if you don't already have subwoofers in your studio, so you can really tell what's happening on the low end, uh, or on a system with subwoofers, um, just to really kind of tell what's what's happening down there. You know, even if it's just your home theater system. Cool. So analog to digital converters, uh, also known as audio interfaces. Um, these are really neat and super helpful for folks uh, that are trying to start just a basic home studio. It's an easy way to allow your mic uh, to be increased to that uh, line level, uh, converted to digital so that we can store it, and then outputted from the storage device in such a way that we can monitor it. So these are really neat. Uh, most uh, interfaces are going to come with mic preamps, like, like here we've got preamps for each input, phantom power so we can power up our condenser mics, headphone outs so it's, uh, an actual output here for your headphones with a, its own volume, a monitor control so you've got your outputs for your monitors here and you've got a, vo a volume control for it here. Uh, most of these are going to be USB but there are newer ones with Thunderbolt, uh, Thunderbolt 3 even. Uh, there's even some older ones with uh, FireWire. They don't make FireWire in computers anymore, so I do recommend staying away from FireWire interfaces. Um, uh, USB is still uh, very handy because it's on a lot of different devices, uh, and you don't need a super, you know, you know, Thunderbolt is really cool, but it's almost unnecessary for audio unless you're also using your interface to do processing as well, because there's now some interfaces uh, include processors so that you can actually increase the power of your computer to allow more plugins and things of that nature. So if you are going to have an interface with a processor, um, you know, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt 3 is really cool. Uh, but the problem there is that not all computers have Thunderbolt 3 yet. So you do have to make sure that it's compatible. We'll talk about that here in just a sec. Uh, the other bit is it does usually include some analog ins and outs. For this example, we've got uh, two inputs in the front with a preamp. We've also got two additional line in unbalanced inputs in the back without preamp. So if you're coming from an unbalanced output from like a mixer or something that had its own preamp, we could plug in there or even just from your phone, you know, your phone has its own preamp. It's also got outputs, you know, again, it's got the left right outputs for your monitor, but it's also got some additional left right outputs if you did say want to run to some outboard gear. Uh, it's, uh, some of them will have optical ins and outs, uh, it's just some additional digital inputs. Some will have MIDI in and out, uh, so you don't have to buy a separate MIDI interface. And some will even have SPDIF, uh, which is, uh, this particular one doesn't have it, but it's just a, a, a neat way of, uh, it's kind of like an early predecessor to Dante, where you can send a uh, stereo unbalanced signal with one RCA cable. So they're kind of neat. They usually add additional stereo inputs with just one RCA input. Um, cool, so cons some considerations for that analog to digital converter uh, and analog interfaces. So whenever you are buying it, these are the things you definitely want to make sure that you've kind of sussed out. Uh, accuracy. So with that, we're talking about bit depth, sample rate. Uh, make sure that you've got the sample rate that you need. You know, if you're only going to, you know, need to ever be doing Super Audio CD 48K, you're probably all right. But, you know, there are some now that can do 96, even 192K. Um, so, you know, if, if you do need something higher, you know, go ahead and make sure you get it because if your interface can't do it, your computer won't be able to do it. Um, connector types. Um, so, you know, we talked about Thunderbolt versus USB versus Firewire. Make sure that it's compatible with your computer. Um, you want to talk about the number of inputs and outputs. Um, you know, so if, if you need, you know, if you're going to mic a whole drum kit, you may need more than just two inputs. So make sure you have enough inputs for what you need. Um, make sure you, you suss out the type of inputs, you know, some of them are quarter inch, some of them are XLR, some of them are combi jacks, which can do either or, um, and just make sure you have the right connector to plug in there or out. Uh, software compatibility, most of them are pretty universal nowadays, uh, but not always, so do make sure that your interface is compatible with your particular DAW of choice, whether it be Pro Tools or Ableton or Logic. Um, and uh, some of them are rack mount and some of them are just uh, simple desktop. So of course that just depends on, you know, do you need the portability, do you need it to, to, to be able to rack. Cool. So uh, just some considerations for recording a live performance. Um, we can talk about multi-track. Multi-track is effectively you're doing it exactly as you would in a recording studio, you know, where you've, uh, it may be that all of your mics get plugged into a split snake and that split snake splits 
to where uh, you know one console is getting uh, all of the uh, the channels while another console is, is getting that same uh, uh, amount of inputs it's just been split so effectively one board is going to be able to do their own control send it to their recording device uh, output monitor uh, while the front of house engineer has his own separate board that can do his own mix for his front of house um, multi-tracking is usually the most accurate because you can uh, then go back and edit in the back end because you've you know you've tracked everything individually. So just like a studio uh, mix, you can then go in and and mix it more accurately uh, versus a split off the board. Um, this is very common uh, downtown where effectively bring out an interface like this. It's got a two channel in, uh, input uh, and you're able to take maybe like a a monitor out or a split off of the main output. Uh, and plug it into input one and two, record that, take it home. The thing there is that whatever you get is what you got. Um, I mean, obviously we can tone control, but we wouldn't be able to say, mix the guitar separate from the vocal uh, in the back end because we're just getting a split off the board. So we're just effectively just recording that left, right off of the main mix. Um, and then there's also room mics. Uh, room mics would be, let's say in a smaller venue where you know if you did just take the, the main mix out, all you're going to get is vocals because maybe they didn't even mic the guitars or uh, things of that nature. So um, to get a nice accurate uh, uh, recording in that situation, you'd probably just set up a couple of room mics, just maybe somewhere a nice sweet spot, somewhere it sounds good in the room. Uh, and you know, and then you know, like this particular device here has some stereo mics built in, so we just place this somewhere really nice in the room, uh, and then we can record how the room sounds, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, you know, because most of the time the engineer, you know hopefully mixed it to sound right. And you can also, with a device like this, this right here is called the H4N uh, by Zoom. You can actually record the split off the board and the room mics at the same time, which is pretty cool. Awesome, guys. Uh, that's our uh, chapter five uh, on signal flow. Again, please let me know if y'all have any questions. Happy to help, and we'll see y'all soon. Thanks again.